Hello and welcome to the introduction for this course. What are the course requirements? You need a computer and internet connection to follow along with this course. Who is this course for? This course is for anyone who wants to learn something new. What is the course format? The format of the course is video. Hello and welcome to this lecture. What is PostgreSQL? PostgreSQL is also pronounced as Postgres. So if you hear people saying Postgres, they mean PostgreSQL. This basically is a relational database management system, um, just like Oracle or Microsoft SQL Server or things like MySQL or MySQL. So it has basically the same features and functionalities of a relational database management system. It also complies to ANSI. ANSI basically is the American National Standard Institute for SQL, which is Structural Query Language. So it also conforms to this standard. So the SQL you use for the Postgres database also follows the ANSI standard. So there are certain ways you write SQL statements that is applicable to all relational databases. Postgres is a general purpose um, database management system. So you can use it basically for a variety of things. It is also object relational. So it's known as an object relational database management system. It is free and open source. Um, by open source, that means people can contribute to make it better. It is also platform independent. What that means is that you can install it on a Windows platform, Mac platform, a Unix platform. So it's platform independent. It's not pegged to one platform. So you can use it across multiple platforms. It is stable and requires minimum maintenance. So most applications that uses the Postgres database, um, you don't really need to um, spend a lot of time in the maintenance because the database itself is quite stable. The database has large storage. It also has a good performance. It's fast. It is extensible. Basically what that means is that you can define your own data types, um, index types. You can also create your own custom plugins. The support for the Postgres is quite substantial. There is an active community that you can post questions to and also receive answers from. So that is it for this lecture. The key thing here is to note that is the Postgres database is a relational database management system, just like Oracle and Microsoft SQL Server. It is free and open source. It is platform independent. And the SQL you use to query the database also follows the ANSI standard. Many thanks for watching and bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'll be showing you how to install PostgreSQL on a Windows 10 computer. This is the official website for PostgreSQL. So to begin, click on the download button and select Windows. So the recommended way to install Postgres is via an installer. So we have to download the installer. The installer also includes the PostgreSQL server and the PG admin, which is a graphical tool for managing and developing your databases and also managing your server. So we're going to do that. So the latest 
version of the installer is 13 so the latest version of Postgres is 13 and that will work on a Windows with a 64-bit Windows platform so if you're running a 32-bit <coughs> So if we take a look here at the platform support, the installer has been tested on the following platform. So a 64-bit Windows platform and the current version of PostgreSQL is 13. So if you're running a 32-bit Windows platform, you will not be able to install Postgres version 11, 12 and 13 because that is not supported you can only use Postgres 10 so I'm on a 64 bit so I'm okay I'm going to run the latest version so I'll click to begin the download of the installer I'll click OK here so to begin I select my operating system the current version is 13.1 I am running a Windows 64 bit, so I'm going to click to download. So the download has started, so that's the download here. I'll give it a few minutes to complete. The download has completed, that's the download here. So I'm going to double click to begin the installation. You may get this user account control come up, just say yes to that. Click next and just accept the default, click next. Accept all the default, click next, click next. And then this is very important, you need to set a password and also retype the password. This is going to be the password you'll be using to log into the PostgreSQL database server. So make sure you remember this password. Once you've entered your password and confirmed it, click Next and accept the default. This is the default port for PostgreSQL. Click Next, click Next and click Next. Next again and wait for the installation to complete. The installation is now complete. You can uncheck this box that says Start Builder may be used to download and install additional tools. You can always come back to that later. So click Finish. To check you definitely have Postgres installed, you go to your Start menu here and then the start menu, you can see the PostgreSQL 13 folder. So expand that and we can click on the PG Admin 4, which is the administrative tool. We'll wait for it to launch and then we can use that to test that Postgres is definitely on the computer. So you can see it is trying to start the PG Admin 4 server which is the administrative server. So once that gets started, we should be able to see the administrative interface. The PG admin tool is a browser based tool. You can see the link here in the browser. So it opens up in the browser. When you first launch it, it will ask you to set a master password. Um, this is different from the password you set when you were installing the when you launch the PG admin the first time you may get this screen here asking you to set a master when you launch the PG admin tool it may ask you to set a master password this password is different from the password you set for the database server during the installation. So if you want to do one, you can just set it here. You don't have to do it now. You can always come back to
to do that later. So I'm going to click to cancel and this is the interface. This is what it looks like. So if you've got your servers, your servers will be listed here. So again, you get this pop up if you click on the server because you can see the red cross, which means that I am not logged into the server. So to log into the server, you will enter the password, which would be the When you see a red cross here, it means that you are not logged in to the server. So to log in to the server, you need to expand this and it will give you the window to log in, It'll give you this window again, where you enter a password. Okay. So you can enter the When you see the red cross here, it means you have not logged in to the server. You can see here, say you've got one server. So to log in, if you click on this here, it will give you this interface again to set a master password. So I'm going to set one and I'm going to set one to be the same as the password I set for the server during the installation, but you can set yours differently if you want. So I've entered the password, I'll click OK. So I've now entered the password for the master. I have now set a master password. So now I can log into the server. So it's now asking for the password to connect to the server. This password is going to be the password you set during the installation of PostgreSQL. So enter that password in here. So I've entered the password, I'll click OK. And you can see now that I've now logged in to the database server. You can see I've now logged into the database server. So this is the main dashboard where you have an overview of what's going on in the server. So the, if you've got any databases, they will be listed here. So you've got the default database, which Postgres give you is called Postgres. And you've got properties here, SQL, statistics, dependencies, dependence. So the dashboard is a good place to have an overview of what's going on in your database. So that's it for this video. In this video, I showed you how to install PostgreSQL database server on a Windows 10 computer. So to, to exit To disconnect from the database, you just right click. Oh, man. To disconnect from the server, just right click and there's an option to disconnect. So disconnect. It will ask if you want to do that. Say OK. And you can see the red cross again, which indicates you are not logged in. It tells you on the bottom here also you've disconnected. OK. So once you're done, you can exit out of the browser. It will ask you, do you want to leave the site? Say leave. So that's it for this video. In this video, I showed you how to install PostgreSQL on a Windows 10 computer. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'll be showing you how to install Postgres on a Mac OS machine. This is the official website for Postgres. So this is the actual link for the website. So if you want to go there and then read more about the documentation. So I'm going to be installing Postgres using Homebrew. There are different ways you can install Postgres, but using Homebrew is much simpler in my opinion. So I'm going to minimize this official website for Postgres and I'm going to open up my terminal. So I've got my terminal on the dock. So I double click to open up the terminal and I'm going to be using homebrew 
to install Postgres. When you're using Homebrew to install packages, it's always a good idea to check that you have everything updated with Homebrew. So I'm going to update Homebrew first using the command brew space update. So I've typed in the command brew space update. I'm going to hit enter and that will update any dependencies that Homebrew has updated. So we'll give it a few minutes to complete the update and then we will install Postgres. The update for Homebrew has completed. So I'm going to clear my terminal by typing in the command clear and I'll hit enter and that clears my screen. So now I'm ready to install Postgres and the command I'm going to use is called brew space install space Postgres. I've typed in the command brew space install space Postgres. I'm going to press enter on my keyboard and that will begin the installation of Postgres. Postgres has been installed successfully. If you want to check the version of Postgres that you have, you can type in the command Postgres space dash dash version. So I've typed in the command Postgres space dash dash version. I'm going to press enter and that will return the version. So it's telling me I've got version 13.1. In this video, I showed you how to install PostgreSQL database server. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'll be showing you how to install PostgreSQL on Ubuntu. To begin, click on the download button select Linux, select Ubuntu and if you scroll down it tells you in this area here the steps you need to take to install PostgreSQL on Ubuntu. So I'm going to start by copying the first line here, copy that and paste that into your terminal. I've pasted that command into the terminal. Make sure you copy it exactly as I've got it here. Don't miss out the quote. Notice there's a single quote at the end here and that's the beginning of the quote. So it's very important you don't miss the quote. Once you've done that, press enter and it's going to prompt you for your password. So enter your password to continue. So once you've entered your password, it should return back to the command. Next, we move on to the second step. I'm going to import the repository sign-in key. So I'm going to copy this line here into the terminal. So I've copied the command into my terminal here. I'm going to press enter and that should return OK. The next step is to update the package list. So we're going to do that using this command, sudo apt-get space updates. I will copy that into the terminal. So I've added the command sudo space apt space get space update. I'll press enter and that will update the list. So the package list has been updated. Now it's time to install the latest version of PostgreSQL. When you are installing a specific version, you have to append the version. So you do Postgres dash whatever version. So if I go back to the home page, uh, we can see that the latest version is version 13. So that is the version I am going to install. So if we go back to the command here now, so this is a command I'm going to type sudo space apt.get-y install postgres-13 because the latest version is 13. So if you don't add the dash 13, you may not get the latest version. So I've entered the command sudo space apt.get-y space install space postgres-13. 
the dash y flag here basically means that if there are any prompts you need to respond to it will automatically respond to that for you so once you've typed in the command just press enter and that will go ahead and install the latest version of PostgreSQL which as of the time I'm recording this video is version 13. The installation is now complete. I'm going to clear the terminal just by typing this command clear or press enter and that should clear the terminal. To check the version of PostgreSQL you have installed, you type in the command apt show space Postgres and then you press enter on the keyboard and that will return the version. So if I scroll up here, you can see here the package is PostgreSQL. The version is 13 plus. So that indicates you have installed the latest version as of the time I'm recording this video. So that is it for this video. In this video, I showed you how to install the latest version of PostgreSQL on Ubuntu. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'll be showing you how to install the PG admin tool. The PG admin tool is a management tool that you can use to administer the PostgreSQL database server. So this is the official website. So this is a link if you want to visit the link and then read more about the tool. There are different ways you can install the tool. I'm going to be installing it using Homebrew. So I'm going to minimize this home page here. 
and open up my terminal. So I've got my terminal on the dock, so I'll click to launch the terminal. Once my terminal launches, I'm going to first of all check if there are any updates for Homebrew. And to check for updates, you simply type brew space update. I've typed in brew space update, I press enter, and that will fetch and then update any updates that are available for my own installation of Homebrew. So we give that a few minutes to complete. And once the update has been done, I will then progress to install PG admin. The Homebrew update has completed. So it's been able to update something on my own installation. Your updates might be different from mine. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is clear the terminal. So I'm just going to type in clear and press enter and that clears the terminal. So now I can install the PG admin tool and I'm going to use this command called brew space cask space install space PG admin four. I've typed in the command to install PG admin. I'm just going to hit enter and that will begin the installation. So I'll give it a few minutes to complete. The PG admin tool has been successfully installed. So you can see it says here, PG admin four was successfully installed. So you can close the terminal. So I'm just going to click on the terminal and then select quit. And if we open up the launch pad on the bottom here, we can see we now have the icon for PG admin four inside the launch pad. So that indicates that we have successfully installed it. So let's click on it and see what it looks like. Let's try and launch it. Let's give it a few minutes to complete the verification. You get a pop-up here asking if you want to open, click open. And then we'll give it a few minutes to launch. The PGC is trying to launch it now. We'll wait for it. It's starting the server. So this is what the PG admin tool looks like when it launches. So you may get a pop up here asking you to set a master password for PG admin. You can do that if you want to. I'm going to click cancel for now. You can always set that at any time. So this is the interface for the PG admin tool, the tool that enables you to manage the PostgreSQL server and interact with it. So this is the main dashboard. This is the properties area here. If you have any property to be listed here, this is the SQL area. If you have any SQL script, then you've got statistics, dependencies, so the dashboard is a good area. Once you start creating databases and interacting with your server, the dashboard area is a good place to check for how things are being managed on your PostgreSQL database server. The PG admin tool is a tool that runs as a service on the web browser, you can see this is the link that it runs on your local machine. So your link or address may be different on your local machine, but this is the address on my local machine. So it's a browser based tool. To exit the PG admin tool, just click on the X here and you get a prompt asking if you want to leave, just say leave page and that will exit. So that's it for this video. In this video, I showed you how to install the PG admin tool. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'll be showing you how to install PG admin on Ubuntu. PG admin is a popular administrative and management tool that is used to administer PostgreSQL 
database server. Let's take a look at a snapshot. If you just click on this. So this is a snapshot of the PG admin four. When you have installed it, this is the dashboard. Obviously you need to have a lot going on in the database to be able to capture the activities in the dashboard area. So you can see here, there's a lot of activities here. The databases are populated and there are actions that can be monitored in the dashboard area. So from the dashboard area, you can basically have a snap preview of what's going on inside your PostgreSQL database. So let's go ahead and install to begin, click download and on the download, click APT. And for APT, the setup instructions are in this area here. So the first thing we want to do is to install the public key for the repository. Um, if you haven't done that already, so we're going to copy this line here and then add that into our terminal. Once you have added the command to your terminal, press enter. It will prompt you for your password. Enter your password to continue. Once you've entered your password, if you have not got curl installed, you will get this message saying that the command curl could not be found because we're trying to install the PG admin using curl. So if you haven't got it installed, it will show you this command. So we have to go ahead and install it using this command sudo apt install space curl. I have typed in the command sudo space apt space install space curl. I'm going to press enter. I'll enter my password and that should progress with the installation of curl. So once you're installing it, you may get a prompt. Do you want to continue? Just click yes to that and press enter. And that will continue with the installation of curl. So curl has now been installed. I'm just going to type Claire to clear my terminal. Now that I've installed curl, I can now copy this command again into my terminal. I'll right click, paste, press enter. And this is what you should get. So once you've got that, next we're going to create the repository configuration file. So again, I'm going to copy this line here and just paste that into the terminal. I've pasted the command, so make sure you don't miss out the quote at the end. Once you've done that, press enter and that will continue with the installation. So we've just created the repository configuration file. The next thing we want to do now is install PG admin. So there are different installations. So if you want to install both the desktop and web nodes, this is the command you use. If you want to install for desktop mode, use that. I want to do both. So I'm going to copy this one here, right click copy and inside my terminal, just after the dollar sign, I'm going to paste that in and press enter on the keyboard. And that will begin the download and installation. You may get a prompt to continue. Just click yes and then press enter. The installation is now complete, so we can close the terminal. So I'm just going to X out. And if I open up this menu here, click on the whiskers menu. And if I type in PG admin, you can see I've got the PG admin here listed. So I'll double click or single click. It's now trying to launch. So give it a few minutes to start the server. When you launch the PG admin, for the first time, you get a prompt to set a master password. This you can probably do later. So I'm going to cancel out of that. This is what the interface for the PG admin for looks like. It's a browser based tool. So you can see the link here on the browser. So you access it via the web browser and it has different options. This is the main dashboard area where you can have an overview of what's going on on your server. 
this is a property page, SQL, statistics, dependencies, and so on. So it's a very important tool. And from here, you can create databases, run SQL queries, and also administer your various databases. So that is it for this video. In this video, I showed you how to install the PG admin tool. So to exit, you can just click on the X on the top here and that will exit out of the tool. Thank you so much for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this lecture, I will show you different ways to connect to a Postgres SQL database. You can connect using an interactive terminal program, which is also the shell, the SQL shell, or also known as PS SQL. Or you can use the graphical tool, which is known as PG admin. So that is the graphical admin tool. So those are the two ways you can connect to a Postgres SQL database. So both the SQL shell, which, ha which houses the PS SQL and the PG admin GUI are installed when the Postgres database is installed. So let's go over to our program menu and explore both options of connecting to the data. To launch PS SQL, you click on the start menu, go to all programs, click on the Postgres SQL 9.6 folder, click to expand. And this is the SQL shell, which houses the PS SQL. So click to launch. And when you open it, this is what you get. If you press enter, it will also add the database name. This shows you that the server is local host. So it's a local installation. So press enter, it will give you the database. So it tells you the database name is Postgres. That's the default database that comes pre-installed when post SQL is installed. If you press enter again, it will give you the port number, which is 5432. And if you press enter, it will give you the username that is used to connect to the database. So this is the username called Postgres. If you press enter, it will prompt you for a password. The password is asking for is the password you would have set during the installation of the database. So just type that password in. So I'm just going to type mine and press enter. If it is right, it will connect to the database and you get this one in here with some instructions here saying blah, 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 but if you can see this flashing cursor, it means that you have successfully connected to the database. And this means the database is just waiting for some instructions. So as it is, you can execute a SQL query. You got, once you've got that flashing cursor there. So that's how you connect to the database using the SQL shell or the PS SQL. I'm just going to exit out of that. The second option is to use the PG admin tool. This is also located in the same directory as the SQL shell. So click on start or programs, go to Postgres, click on that. And this is what we want. PG admin four. That's the current version. If you click on that, it will launch the PG admin tool and the latest version of that tool is version four. Please be patient with this tool. It can sometimes take a while to open up. Once the tool opens up, we can connect to the database by expanding the servers here where it's got servers. Click on the plus sign to expand. 
and you've got the postgres sql 9.6 so click on that it will give you an option to enter your password so i'm just going to click expand that there you go so this should pop up it says connect to server and the username it's using to connect is postgres so you need to type in the password you set during the installation so i'm just going to pop my password in there and click ok and if everything checks out you can see here it says server connected once you're connected it tells you you are connected and we can now access the database so these are the at the moment we've only got one database that's why it's got one there which is the default database installed with the postgres sql database which is this one here that's our default database so basically those are the two main ways you can um, connect to a postgres sql database another way to actually interrogate or interact with the database is via the query so if we click on the tools here and go to click on select the database first make sure you got the database selected and then click on tools and click on the query tool and that should bring up the query editor so just write a simple query that will interact with the database so you just type in select followed by the version you're looking for the version and then parentheses and the semicolon and then you click on this arrow there to execute the query and it will show the result in the output here so this is the output for the query it tells you the version is PostgreSQL 9.6 and give you some information about the build and so on. So this tells you, you can expand this, by the way, you can see I've just dragged it to expand it along to reveal more information. So it gives you the version and tells you it's compiled by Visual C++ and the rest of it. So that's one way of also interacting with the database. So thank you so much for watching. In this lecture, we've learned how to connect to PostgreSQL, PostgreSQL database server by using different methods. Thanks for watching and bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this lecture, I'll be showing you how to load a sample database into postgres sql the sample database we are going to use is called a dvd rental database this is a sample database taken from the sakila sample database from the mysql site so this is the database i'm referring to um, so basically I made some slight modifications to it to make things a lot easier for you. Uh, it's called a DVD rental. I've already extracted it here. So this is the extraction. This will be included in the resource page for this lecture. So you can just download it and follow along. This database should be more than enough for us to learn and practice using Postgres SQL. The database itself contains many objects. It has 15 tables, one trigger, seven views, eight functions, one domain. It also has 13 theme sequences so once you've got the file downloaded this file here which is going to be available for you to download inside your resource page for this lecture 
Um, once you've got that downloaded, um, the best what I need you to do is go to your local drive and say your local C drive. If you're on the Windows, okay, and create a temp folder. So create a folder called temp, as I've done here, and add that file to it. So on your C drive, make sure you have a folder called temp and just add the DVD rental zipped or ext extracted file, the actual compressed file. Before don't extract it, just make sure you add the compressed file into that temp directory. Um, you can see two other files. These are not related to this lecture. These are other files that I can delete this actually because they're not related to this course. So you should only have this compressed file called DVD rental inside this temp directory, which is housed in the root of the C drive. Once you've got that done, launch the admin tool, which is the, I've already got it open here, which is the PG admin tool. You can launch that from the all programs, go to PostgreSQL and click on PG admin four. So I've already got the tool selected. Make sure you've got your, the next thing we need to do because we are going to load a database we need to create a new database. So to do that, you right click on where it's got databases and go create database. So we are going to create a new database called DVD rental. So we need to give the database a name. I'm just going to call it DVD rental. I've got it all in lowercase, but it's up to you. It doesn't really matter. And the owner will be this user here called Postgres. And then in the comment, you can say whatever you want. I'll just say DVD rentals. Okay. And just click save. And by clicking save, that should um, install the database. So if I right click and refresh this now, this figure should, should change. You see, it's already changed to two, which means we have now successfully created a database called DVD rental. Now we can load the sample database. To do that, you just right click on where it says DVD rental, right click on that. And there's an option to restore, click on restore. All right. You get this saying, please configure the Postgres SQL binary path. All right. So what we need to do is configure the path for that. So click OK and click on your file option. Go to preferences and look for path. This is what it's complaining about on that path. Click on binary path. And inside the binary path, we need to go to where we installed the software. So we installed in program files and there should be click on Postgres and click inside that folder, click on the bean directory and click to get the path. So this is the path is asking for copy that and paste it in there and say OK. If it's happy with that, there should be no complaint. So what you need to do now, we can go back and restore the database. So click on DVD rental, click on restore, and that error should no longer occur. OK, format, select format is going to be custom or tar. Click on that. File name, we need to select where it is the location. These three dots here gives you, lets you, enables you to browse the location of where the files are. 
Okay. Alternatively, you can manually insert the location of the file. So we're just going to go to where we've got the file stored. Is in a temp folder. This temp folder here. Because sometimes it's slow. Now it's opened up. Sometimes that can be slow to open. So we click on that, the C drive, and it's inside a temp folder. It says it can't find any files. Okay. So I'm going to click cancel. It sometimes it can have problem locating the files. So I'm just going to go manually and get the location, which is in a temp folder, DVD rental, and then just cancel out of that. If you click, all you need to do is just do a slash and add DVD. DVD rental, and that's it. And just get the path from there. Copy and paste it in here. And that should be it. You can leave the other option blank. Real name, you don't really need that. We Or you can just select Postgres, which is the user that has the privilege to install the software. So click on this restore button here. And if everything goes to plan, it tells you here, restore job created, restoring backup on the server, gives you all kinds of information regarding the backup. It tells you successfully completed. So we have successfully restored the database. So we can quickly check the database. This is the database here. If you click on this schema to expand it, the tables will be located inside the schema and the name of the schema is public. Click to expand that. And then we can see all the objects for the database. So these are the tables. These are the trigger sequences. Let's focus on the tables here. Let's expand that we should see 15 tables it tells you there 15 tables so we've got all our tables loaded so we are good to go for the rest of the course we've got our lab sorted and uh, we can progress with the rest of the course so if you've successfully loaded the database well done if you've got any issues please do not hesitate to let me know many thanks and bye for now Hello and welcome to this video. I'm going to introduce you to some basic database concepts. I'm going to start with a database. What is a database? A database is basically a collection of organized information or data that is stored in a table. So let's take a look at an illustration of what a database looks like. So this is a basic illustration of a database. So a database stores information or data in a table. So this is basically a table and a table consists of columns. The columns are the ones across in blue and it also consists of rows. These rows are known as records. So each record is unique in a table. So we now know that a database stores information in a table. What is a table? A table basically stores information in rows and columns just like in an Excel spreadsheet. So if we take a look at the illustration I showed you previously, we can see that this is a database that consists of a table. And the table has information in rows and columns. So these rows are horizontal, Okay, so these are all rows, they are, they are horizontal and they represent unique records in a table. The columns or fields are in blue and they are vertical. So age, city, address, last name and first name can be referred to as columns 
of fields in a table, while the rows here are referred to as records. So each record should be unique in a table. Next, I want to introduce you to the concept of a relational database. A relational database basically is a database where two or more tables are related. So I'm going to show you a quick illustration. So this is an illustration where we have several tables in the database. So this customers is one table, orders is one table, order items is another table, products is another table. So with a relational database, there must be relationship between two or more tables. If we take a look at the customers table here, we've got a customer ID, which is a column or a field in the customers table. We've also got a customer ID here, which is also a field or a column in the orders table. So you can see the dot representing the relationship because there's a customer ID there and there's a customer ID there. All right, if we look at this order items table and this order table, we've got an order ID, we've got an order ID. You can see the dot here representing the relationship. Likewise, we've got a table called products. You can see that we've got a product ID and we've also got a product ID in this order item. So you can see the dot here representing the relationship between the tables. Next, we're going to look at what a relational database management system is, also referred to as RDBMS for short. A relational database management system is basically a software that is used to manage databases. So there are several types of relational database management system depending on the vendor. Examples include Oracle, Microsoft, SQL Server, MySQL, PostgreSQL, and many others. Next, I'm going to introduce you to the concept of a primary key. A primary key basically is used to uniquely identify each record in a database. Most primary keys must contain unique values. That means a primary key cannot contain null value. A null value basically is a value that is not represented, is unknown. So there must be a record that identifies each record uniquely in a database table. Also, a table can have only one primary key, which can consist of a single or multiple fields. So again, looking at this illustration of a table, we can see here that where we've got PK, PK represents a primary key. We're using the customer ID as a primary key to identify each record in the table. In this table, there we're using the order ID as a primary key. The next concept is a foreign key. A foreign key basically is a key that is used to link two tables together. So a foreign key can also be a collection of fields in one table that refers to the primary key in another table. So again, using this illustration here, we've got um, in this table, for example, we've got customer ID as a primary key, while in this table called orders, we've got customer ID as the foreign key. So the table that contains the foreign key is called the child table. And the table containing the um, primary key is, is called the parent table. So in this case, the customer ID here where we've got the primary key is a parent table, 
while the customer ID here where we've got the foreign key is the child table. The next concept I want to introduce you to is constraints. Constraints basically are used to specify the rules you want your data to follow in a table. And when you are setting up constraints, you can actually implement it at the point of creating the table. So when you're creating a table, you can also implement different types of constraint. Uh, an example constraint you could implement, for example, in any of the fields, you could say you don't want the value to be null. Null basically means that a value that is not known. Say, for example, here, I can specify that the customer last name, I can place a constraint in this field and say the customer last name um, cannot be null. That means they must provide a name for the customer name. Without that, it will not allow the input for that column. So that's basically what a constraint means. There are different types of constraint you can use to specify different types of rules you want your data to follow in a table. So any data you input, you want a set of rules for that data to comply with. So that's it for this video. In this video, I introduced you to some key and basic database concepts. Thank you for watching and bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we are going to look at the server service. When you install Postgres um, for the first time, you usually will have a corresponding Postgres server service. It is also referred to as the Postgres server. So let's open up our admin panel so we can take a look. So to open up the admin, go start and look for the Postgres server, um, the folder. So you see a folder here called Postgres 9.6. Click to expand and click to open the PG admin 4. And that will launch the admin panel. Um, this can sometimes take a while to launch, but um, it shouldn't take too long, hopefully. So once the PG admin opens, we can click on the plus sign here to expand the servers. So you can see the list of servers. So just expand that. And you are prompted for a password. So this will be the password set when you install the Postgres database. So type in the password. you get prompted for this password each time. Um, if you don't want to get prompted, you can click to save, but that is not a good practice, uh, especially in a production live environment. But if it's a test environment like we are doing now, you can do that, but it's good to cultivate good habits, um, regardless if you're in a live or test environment. So click OK, and that will um, give you access to all the databases and objects of the Postgres. So when you install an instance of Postgres, you also have a corresponding Postgres server service, which is also the Postgres server. So you can see the list of servers here. We've got the Postgres. This is actually the Postgres server. Um, you can install multiple Postgres servers on a physical server using different ports and also having different locations to store the data. So it is possible to install multiple Postgres servers on a physical server, provided you use different ports and also store the data in different locations. So if you want to see more of just make sure click on this Postgres here option here and then click on properties and you can see a more detailed um, view of the server service. 
So it gives you some information here, tells you the name, the server type, PostgreSQL, the version, gives you the version, and it tells you the port number it's installed to. 5432 is the default, and gives you, tells you connected, true, and let's have a look. And yeah, maintenance tells you that, username, SSL mode, give you optional prefer so these are those some um, information you can access from the property option when you select the postgres um, option here and the server also has some databases here so if i expand the databases here you can see it's got two here which means there are two databases listed um, the one is called the DVD rental, which is a sample database that we loaded on. And this Postgres database is the default database that comes when you install an instance of the Postgres relational database system. So the key thing here in this lecture is to note that the Postgres server service is also known as the Postgres server, okay, which is this one here. And that comes installed when you install an instance of the Postgres relational database system. So that is it for this lecture on the server service. Many thanks for watching and bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we'll be exploring a database. A database basically is a container of other objects such as tables, views, functions, indexes, and so on. You can usually create as many databases as you want inside a post Grace server. So a database is a container of other objects, which includes objects like tables, views, functions, indexes, and other objects as well. So let's go over to our admin panel and have a look at the database and its related objects. I have already logged in to the PG admin for if you are not logged in you can log log in by go to all programs and select the Postgres folder and then click to launch the PG admin for once you launch it in and you try to access the database or the server it will prompt you for a password just enter the password you set during the installation of the Postgres database. So the databases on this Postgres server at the moment are two. We've got this DVD rental that we loaded and we've got the Postgres database. This comes built in when you install an instance of the Postgres server. It also installs a Postgres database. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to expand this DVD rental database so we can have a look at some of its related objects. So all these here are all related objects for a database in the Postgres server. So I'm just going to expand this here, the schema here. So within the schema, there is also the public. Let's expand that. And then we can take a look add some other related objects like a table we've mentioned the table so these are the tables for this database if i expand that you can see it says there are 15 tables for that database and also you've got things like functions you've got various types of functions for this these are functions doing different things we've also got um sequences so if you you know if you're trying to add a record you want them to be in sequence and so on and then you've got views views are like um, tables are like virtual tables 
So these are all related objects of a database. So the database itself is a container of other objects. Um, and these here, anything on the, this, uh, this is the database, all these here are all container objects for the database. So that's basically what a database is. That's it for this lecture. Many thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. A table is basically used to store data for a database. So any data that is stored in a database is usually stored inside a table. In a database, you can create as many tables as possible. Open up your PG admin for tool. I've already logged into mine and I'm just going to explore some of the tables inside this DVD rental database. So I've got the DVD rental database expanded and I'm just going to expand the schema and from within the schema, we've got the public expanded and there is some tables here. So I'm just going to expand the tables. So these are all the tables here for the DVD rental database. And data for a database is usually stored in table. What I'm going to do, I'm going to run a very quick query so you can see how the table data is structured. So I'm going to run a quick query to see all the columns and rows for this table here called actor. So to do that, I'm just going to right click and click on query tool. And the query tool is the tool you need. It's a built in tool that you need to um, interrogate data from the database. So this is a tool here. So I'm just going to write a quick statement here do select so i'm now using sql to communicate with the database i'm just select star star meaning all from the database the table is actor and you have to put a semicolon at the end to indicate that's the end of the statement so what this statement is saying is that i want to retrieve all the data that has been stored in this table here called actor so if i click on this thing here that looks like a lightning bolt and that will execute the statement and it will show the output in this window here so it tells you here the total query time tells you the time it took basically so this is the structure so this is how a table stores data in columns and rows so you can see the columns here going this way and uh, you can see the rows here these are all the rows going vertically and the columns going horizontally so you can see this is all the data from this table here called actor by using the asterisk sign it retrieves all the data from the columns and the rows relating to that table so this is basically how a table stores its data in columns and rows and a database stores all its data inside tables there are various tables and the tables also can have some relationship between each other so we've got a table called actor there may be some kind of relationship via one of the columns to other tables within the same database. So that is it for this lecture on tables. Many thanks for watching and bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. What is a schema? A schema is a logical container of tables and other objects inside a database. Each Postgres database can have multiple schemas. A schema is useful in a production environment. 
in that you can assign permissions to different IT professionals to perform various tasks within a specific schema. I have um, signed into the PG Admin 4 and here on the, the database section, we've got a database called DVD Rental. And if you notice here, we've got this schema. It says here, there's only one schema. And that schema, you can see the symbol here is a public schema. If I right click, we can look at the properties of that schema. It gives you the name, which is public and tells you who owns the schema. And there's also a comment here. It tells you standard public schema, which means everyone has access to this schema. However, in a production environment, you can create several schemas. And within that schema, you can have various database objects inside that schema. For example, you can create a schema called finance and assign permissions to those who only work in the finance department. You don't really want to make that type of schema public for everyone to see because it contains sensitive information. For example, people's salaries and other financial related information. So schemas are quite important because you can use schema to group related objects and then just assign permissions to that schema. You could also have a schema, for example, for IT professionals. And, you know, as again, you assign specific uh, permissions to those who can perform tasks within that schema. Even within a schema, you can still lock things down if you wish to. You can, for example, with it, you can create a schema called finance. And within that finance schema, you can also lock certain tables or limit the access to certain tables from people who work in that finance department. But schemas are good in that they help, um, they act as a logical container to hold um, various database related objects. So that is it for this project on schema. Um, just know that the schema is a logical container that holds tables and other objects inside a database. And it is possible to assign permissions to schema so you can restrict who has access to the objects inside a schema. Many thanks for watching and bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. What is a table space? A table space is basically a storage location where the actual data that is underlying the database objects can be kept. It basically provides a layer of abstraction between the physical and the logical data and also serves to allocate storage for all relational database managed segments. We know that data in a database table in a database is actually stored in tables in the actual tables they are actually stored in table spaces. By default, Postgres has two table spaces. The two default table spaces provided by Postgres when the relational database management system is installed are the PG default and the PG global. So these are use the, the first one, which is a PG default is used for storing users data. This PG default while the PG underscore global is used for storing system data. So PG underscore default stores users related data. 
and PG underscore global stores system related data. So we can take a look at the default table spaces. If you log into the PG admin four, I've already logged in, but if you not sure how to log in, just go to start all programs, click on the Postgres folder and just click to open the PG admin four. Once you click on the database, it will prompt you for a password. Just enter the password you set during the installation. So let's have a look at the tab default table spaces. So under here, you've got table spaces. You can see there it's got two, which means there are two table spaces. These come as default when you install the Postgres server. So let me expand so you can see them. So you can see the first one is called PG underscore default. This is used to store user related data. So any data relating to the users is stored in this table space. While the second is PG underscore global. This table space stores any data relating to the system. So these two come as default when you install the Postgres server. So that is it for this lecture on table space. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. What is a view? Views are basically virtual tables that are used to basically help simplify complex queries. They can also be used as a kind of security to protect certain records from others. So views basically are treated just like a table. So you can execute or run queries on a view just as you would on a table. You can use views to hide information or um, protect certain parts of a table from others to see. So you can create views from a table. The sample database, which is this DVD rental has some views. So let's take a look at them. So we're going to expand the schema here. And um, from the schema, if I scroll down, you see we've got seven views here for that table, for that database. So if I click to expand, you can see these are different views. For example, we've also got a, if I look, notice here, we've got a view called actor info. Let me click to expand that. So views basically have same characteristics as a table. So you've got columns and you can also have rows. Okay. So these are all the, so you can query, basically you can query a view just as you would a table. So let's, let's quickly query this view here. We've got a view here called actor info. So let me right click and select the query tool and it should launch the query tool shortly. And when it launches, I'm just going to quickly query this view. So you query them the same way you would query a table. So I'm going to just do a simple query here. The select star star means I want all the rows and columns from that view to be returned. So let's start from, you always have to use from to specify where the data is coming from. So the data is coming from the name of the view is called actor underscore info, and then place a semicolon at the end of the statement. So this is the name of the view here. If I execute it by pressing this here, it should give me an output here. Okay. 
So basically this is, it tells me here 200 rows retrieved from this query. So it basically behaves the same way as a table. It's basically a virtual table. So you run query, you can run queries on views just as you would a table. If I click on this table, I've got a tables, got tables here. I've also got a table called actor. Okay. And you see here, I've got a view here called actor underscore info. So views are virtual tables and they're quite useful in that you can use them to simplify complex queries. Okay. And also you can use them as a security measure to hide certain records from certain people or certain parts of the organization. So that's basically what views are. Many thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture on functions. What are functions? Functions in Postgres are basically a block of reusable SQL code. The code can also return a scalar value of a list of records. It also can return composite objects. Let's take a look at some functions that have been created inside our sample database. We've got a sample database here called DVD rental. So if I expand the schema, we can see inside the schema, there are functions. So we've got eight functions for this database. So let me expand that and they do different things. So they're basically SQL code that can be reused over and over again. So these are all the various types of functions created for this sample database. So you can create your own functions as well. So let's um, have a look at one of them here. Um, this one here says get underscore customer balance. That's the name of the function. So to explore the function, I'm just going to right click on the properties of one of them. This one here that says get underscore customer underscore balance. And I go properties and within the properties, we can have a look at several things. So let's start with the definition. So click on this definition tab. And if I just expand this, you can see more about the function, how the function was written. So you've got the arguments for the function, the types of argument the function takes is in there. The type of value it returns, it tells you it's numeric. The language is PLPG SQL. And this is the actual code, okay, that generates the function or activates the function. So this is the actual code. These are basically SQL statements. So that is the definition. Let's look at the options here. What we've got in the options. Um, all this estimated cost hundred. Let's look at arguments. So you can look at different aspects of the function to see how it was created and what it does. So these are the data type. The data type is integer, which means it's a number. You've got timestamp without the time zone. You've got argument P underscore custom ID, P underscore effective date. Uh, let's look at the parameters. There's no parameters set. What about security? Um, no obvious security issues here. Then look at the SQL. It tells you nothing has changed since it was created. So no modification has changed. So the SQL part of it has nothing new to, um, explain because nothing has changed from the, when it was defined. So I can just click cancel out of it. So you can do the same with the others just to look through to see how it has been set up. So the key thing to take away basically is that a function is a reusable block of code. If there are specific tasks that you perform repetitively over time, you can um, build that into a function and just 
execute that function to perform that task. You can also delete a function as well by dropping them. So for example, if you no longer need it, just right click and there's an option to delete or drop a function. And you can also create a function as well using this tab and using the create function tab. So there's different things you can do. You can create scripts from them. You can using the create script, or if you want, just want to read data, you can use the select script to um, extract SQL from the functions and just read data from the database. So several things you can do with a function tab. So that's basically it for this lecture on functions. Many thanks for watching and bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, I'm going to explain what a cost and operators are in Postgres. I'll start with a cost. Cost basically enables you to convert one data type into another data type. When you perform conversions using cost, it's usually done in combination with functions. So you use functions in combination with cost to perform conversions. Postgres has default cost, but you can create your own custom cost that will override the default ones created by Postgres. Operators in Postgres basically is a symbolic function. So Postgres allows you to define custom operators. Looking at our sample database, we have an option for cost, but as you can see, there is none at the moment. So no cost has been created. So if we had created a cost, this is where it will be. Also functions, also the operators are a kind of symbolic function. So if you need to create or define your own custom operators, um, you also can do them and, and they will be housed within the schema. So you've got the functions tab here. So you can create your operator, which are a kind of symbolic function. So just to wrap up for this lecture, cast basically enables you to convert one data type into another data type, while operator is basically a symbolic function. So in Postgres, it allows you to define your own custom operators. When you are using cost for conversions, you use it in combination with functions. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, I'm going to briefly explain what sequences are. Sequences are used to manage auto increment columns. That is columns that have auto increments on them. This is usually um, identified with ID columns columns that have to be unique. We are going to look at our sample database and see the sequences that have been created for that database. Please log in to your PG admin four. I've already logged in and select the option for the sample database, which is DVD rental, click on the plus sign to expand it. And if we expand it further, go to where the schemas are, expand the schema, and we should see the sequences. This database has 13 sequences. So let me expand that to see. So these are the various sequences 
that have been created for this database. So let me take a look at one of them so we can see how sequences actually works. Um, normally when you create sequences, you can see the naming convention. You have to name it with the underscore. You have to have a SEQ to indicate that it is a sequence. So let me click on this one here, the first one here, actor underscore actor ID sequence. So obviously there's a table here called actor and that table, um, there's been a sequence created for that table. So I'm going to right click on this one here and select the properties. So if we go to the property, it tells you what the name of the sequence is. If we look at the definition, it tells you normally when you create a sequence, you have to set a maximum value. So here, this is a maximum value and it tells you here, this is the current value for this um, sequence. So for example, if I was to insert another data into this, um, into that table, into this table, and I use the ID, it will increase it by one. So the, it will now turn that into 201. So it's a column that auto increases. So if I insert a record for say actor ID, it will automatically change that value to 201. So let's look at the security on that. Uh, nothing special. Look at the SQL, nothing has changed. So I'm going to cancel that and I'm going to see if I can create a script. If you want to create a sequence, that's this is the syntax. You just click on create sequence and it gives you the option. You have to name the sequence and the owner, the schema, and then you have to define the sequence. You specify the increment. How is the sequence going to increase? Is it going to increase by one, by two, and so on? So these are all the parameters you set when you create a sequence. So I'm going to look, right click and go where it's got create script. I'm just going to create the script. This is a script that you will, that will generate for you if you want to create a sequence. So let me just break it down a bit so you can see. So this is what the sequence looks. This is basically how you create a sequence. This is the sequel for it. You start with the word create sequence, and then this public layer indicates the schema, which is the schema here. And this here is the name of the sequence. Okay. Which is actor underscore actor ID sequence. The sequence will increase by one. So if you want to insert records into a table called actor, um, that it, that sequence, the ID column, we automatically increase to the next value. If, for example, the first record that you created has an ID of one, the sequence will, when you create another record, the sequence, we automatically give it an ID of two and so on. And this in increment means it increases by one. So if you add another record, that record will, will assume the next value. For example, if the record is four, it will assume five. The next added will be six and so on. Also here is notice that it says start 200, which means that the current record for that table is 200. That means there are 200 records in that table. So if I was to add another record, it will increase by one. That means the next record will now be 201. So there's an increment value. There's a minimum value. And this is the maximum value, which is the amount of sequences that can be created. This is the value of the kit. And then you have a cache. Normally you can have a sequence in cache and use that. All right. So it tells you who owns the sequence. And if you want to alter and make modifications, you can use the alter sequence command to make modifications. So this here basically is the query you use to um, create a sequence. So it's basically the same thing as when you write, if you do create sequence and in the definition, all this here listed here is basically what this SQL is doing. Sequences are useful also in a live production environment. If you've got several people updating the same record or adding 
new records, you don't want the records to be out of sync. So by using a sequence for a column, when one adds a record, it automatically, you know, attaches a sequence value and increases that record. So sequence are quite useful to keep records in sync. So that's it for this lecture on sequences. Many thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, I'll be explaining briefly what the concept of extensions are in Postgres. Basically, in Postgres, extensions are used to wrap other objects into a single unit. The main purpose of extensions basically is to make it easier to maintain. So by wrapping other objects into a single unit, it's easier to maintain them. Um, the types of objects you can wrap up into a single unit as an extension includes cast, indexes, functions, and other objects. I have logged into my PG admin for and going to take a look at the built-in extensions that has come pre-installed with the instance of Postgres database and also the sample database we loaded um, has also got an instance of an extension. So I'm just going to expand the databases. We've got two databases listed. So I'll click on the plus sign. We'll take a look at the sample database we loaded, which is this DVD rental. So I just expand that and you can see we've got one extension and the extension is a PLPG SQL. So if I right go to the properties, we can see the name, um, that's the ID, the owner. Um, let's look at the SQL. This is the SQL basically used to create it. This is the schema it belongs to, PG underscore catalog. Let's look at the stats, dependencies, none, dependence, okay. He's got some dependence here. There is a function that's dependent on that. And we've got these functions all dependent on that. So there is some dependence, but no dependencies. So extensions basically are used to wrap other objects to make it easier to maintain. So we'll go on extension here in PLPG SQL. So let's have a look at the default database that was installed, which is this Postgres. If I expand that, it has two extensions. So let's have a look at what the extensions are. We've got, we've got the PLG SQL, which we've looked at an instance in the sample database. And we've got one called admin pack. So I'm going to right click and go properties. So we can look at the properties. That's the name. And it tells you what it does. It's for administrative functions for Postgres. So a lot has been wrapped into this admin pack. <coughs> we can look at the definition. Um, just tells you the version. Look at the SQL. Nothing has changed. If we come here, right click. If you want to create a new extension, you use that with the create command and click on create extension and that will give you all the options and parameters to add. Again, you can delete or drop a extension. You can cascade, you can create a script from it. So if we wanted to create a script from it, it should also generate a script. So this is a script. I'm just going to bring it down a bit. So you can see this is basically a script that's been used to create this extension called admin pack. So that's it for this lecture on extension. Extensions basically is a concept um, where you wrap other objects 
into a single unit, making them much easier to manage. Many thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, you will learn how to create a database using the PG4 admin tool. To access the admin tool, you need to go to all programs if you're on a Windows and locate the Postgres folder. If you expand that, the PG Admin 4 tool is located inside that folder. So click to launch the tool. Give it a few minutes to launch. When the admin tool loads up, just click to expand the servers and click on the Postgres server. Once you click on that, it will give you an option to log in. So if you can just enter the password that you entered during the installation of the Postgres server. Click OK and it should give you access. It tells you server connected on the bottom right. So now to create a database, we just right click on this databases folder here and click on create and then database. It should give you a dialog box to enter some details. You need to enter the database name. I'm going to call mine fruits and you can put a comment if you want. I'm just going to say database of fruits and that's basically it if you click save it should create the database give it a few minutes so the database has been created that's the database here when you create a database it jumps to the top so that's the database we've just created so click on the plus sign to expand it so you can see more about the database so these are all the objects that come with the database this is a schema if i expand that um, it creates it under the public schema and it also creates other stuff so creates these are the objects that are created when you create a new database so we can check on the properties by clicking on this property icon there to see what the properties are and this is basically the properties of the database so when you create a database um, by default there are certain things you enter others can be completed for you um, like these here grayed out there's the security option here so none of that was completed the definition was um, inserted for you um, this is the encoding by default, it gives you this table space. Collation indicates the language you're using. So I'm in the UK, so it's put that there. Template, it says, no, I'm not using any template. Allow connections, yes. You can also decide not to allow a connection if you create a database and you just want to use it for testing purposes and you don't want any connection while you are doing some tests. Other things you can check, you can check, click on the SQL to see this is the SQL that was actually generated when you create a database. So if I was to create a database using SQL or SQL, this is how I would create it. From the information I provided, it has generated a SQL for the database. So this is the SQL used to create the database. Um, click on statistics. There shouldn't be that much. Um, so these are various statistics relating to the database. Um, dependencies, there shouldn't be. Dependents, there's no dependents. So you can also access the property page by right clicking on the database itself and going properties. Once you're in the properties, you can also click on the definition. These, are, This was the only information we completed during the um, creation of the database. The definition part was actually inserted for us by 
this tool. So all this here, we didn't do it. The tool inserted it for us automatically. And security, if at some point you want to implement security on the database, this is where you implement the security. So you have to be a guarantor to add privileges. And then this is where you grant the users. Parameters, if you've got the parameters, this is where you add it. Default privileges, if there's any, this is where it will be. And the SQL here tells you nothing has changed from the SQL that was used to generate or the SQL that was generated when the database was created. So that's basically how you create a database using the PG Admin 4 tool. Many thanks and bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, you will learn how to create a table using PG4 Admin. Open up your PG Admin 4 tool. I've already opened mine and I'm already logged into the server. So to create a table, there must be a database already in presence. So you create a table inside a database. So the database I'm going to create the table on is this database called fruits. I create, we created this um, database earlier. So I'm just going to expand this database and look for the schema. This is a schema inside the schema, which is called public. There are tables, although there's no tables at the moment, but this is where you create tables from. So to create a table, you right click on tables, which is under this fruits database and click on create and then table. And it should give you an option to enter the table name. So I'm going to call my table oranges. And it tells you the owner is Postgres. The schema is public. You can select a table space if you want. Um, if once you've done, just click save and it should create the table name. So you can see here, that's the table oranges. We've now created a table so we can go back to the table, right click and go properties and we can add more bits to the table, we can add columns. So to add columns, we click on that. And before we do that, let me click on the general tab. You can see it's um, created it in the default PD underscore default table space. So let's go to columns and let's start adding the tables and um, the columns. It gives you option to, you can inherit from tables. If you've got other tables, you can inherit um, columns from tables gives you that option but I'm not going to do that I'm going to create new columns so click on this plus sign here to create a column so with tables they store data in columns and rows so I'm going to call this category ID and I'm going to select the data type which it has to be an integer because it's going to be a number. So I'll select integer, uh, leave this to blank and I'll select, do I want it to accept null value? No, I want there to be a value. So I say, yes. Do I want to make it a primary key? Yes. I want it to be the primary key. So this um, column here, all the records in this column will be unique. So that is the first column. So I click to save it and I can add more columns. I go back, go into properties. I wait for it to load. And then I go to columns again and I click on the plus sign. Give me another row. So I, at this time I'm going to add a name and I'm going to make the character varying character. So I'll type in character varying, so it'll be a varying character. You can give it a length. I'm going to give it 
25 for the name i don't expect there will be any fruit that will have more than 40 25 characters of name um again i want there to be a name i don't want that value to be empty so i say yes i want it to be a null value i want i don't want any null value Null middle means there is no you don't know so you know but you by making this yes is forcing you to enter a name for the category so i click save i can i'm going to add one more i go right click again i go properties wait for it to load and i'm going to columns and I click on the plus sign i'm going to make this color so i want to find out the color of the fruits again i'll make this varying character varying um, i make it 25 as well um, i'll leave this this so this can be empty if you're not sure what color the fruit is so i don't want to enforce that so i'll leave that option open so if people are not sure what color it is i want that left blank or null i'll click save so we've now created a table with three columns if i expand this you can see the columns of the table so these are the columns it tells you here three column there are other things you can apply to the table if i go on the properties for example you can give it a you can apply constraints um, you notice because i've added a primary key to one of the table it's made that a constraint constraint basically in a way is kind of like a check it forces you it means you you can't progress unless you enter something in that um in that field okay so there are other options here advanced parameters security you can add security to a table so you can give access or restrict access if you want to do that this is the area you will be doing that and the sql basically tells you nothing has changed since the table was created so if you want to see the sql that was used to create the table all you need to do once let me cancel out of this i click save so if you want to see the sql or the sql you right click on the name of the table and where it's got scripts just click on create and that will generate a script with the um, create command so there you go so this is a script that you would use if you were to create it without um, that is not with the table not from within the admin tool so this basically is the sql or the script um, used to this script is, was generated when you created the table so if i wasn't going to use the admin tool i wanted to use sql or sql this would be the sql i would use to create the table so that's it for this lecture on creating a table using the pg4 admin tool many thanks for watching and bye for now